Hello, my name's Adam Fry. I'm an international euphonium soloist. I'm lucky enough to travel around the world playing, teaching, and sharing the beautiful sound of the euphonium. I'm very excited that you've chosen to play the euphonium also. Music is a wonderful experience. In band, you're going to meet and make a lot of new friends, experience a lot of great music, and have a lot of fun. It's a wonderful experience, and I'm so glad that you've selected to start. I thought we should begin with a small tour of the instrument. Make sure you know what the parts are when your band director refers to them and when you see them written in the book. The first thing that you learned about is the mouthpiece when you pulled it out of the case. You also learned about the main body of the instrument. As you know, the mouthpiece connects to the lead pipe, which is located here. And it's right below the main bell section. Your euphonium may have three or four valves. And they're numbered in order from first valve, second valve, third valve, and fourth valve. Each valve has its own slide. Connected to the first valve is the first valve slide. Connected to the second valve is the second valve slide. Connected to the third valve is, as you guessed it, the third valve slide. Now, the fourth valve slide on most student level euphoniums is actually located on the back. And of course, there's the main tuning slide located at the bottom. We'll talk more about its job in the tuning section. Now, let's get to know the valve a little bit more. The valve has a couple of parts. There's the valve top. There's the valve cap. And you'll notice this is how we'll oil the valve later in the video. There's also, on the back, the valve cap for the bottom. It also loosens and tightens. We can take the valve out, and we'll do this for cleaning and oiling. And inside the valve casing, which is the body here, is a small spring that allows the valve to move up and down when we press it. The final part of the instrument that we want to learn about is the water key. And this is on the main tuning side. And it's used for emptying water out of the instrument. I'd like to begin this video by telling you about the differences between the baritone and the euphonium. You may hear your director and also see in the books the term baritone and euphonium used regularly. The smaller instrument is a baritone. The middle instrument is a student level euphonium. And this instrument is a professional level euphonium. Let's look at the specific differences between the instruments. The main difference between a baritone and a euphonium involves the shape of the tubing. The euphonium is quite conical. And what that means is that the tubing starts small and as it proceeds through the instrument, it gradually gets larger all the way through the instrument. On a baritone, the tubing is more cylindrical, meaning that it stays the same for a longer period of time. You also notice on the baritone that the bell, the body, the tubing, and the mouthpiece are all much smaller than on the euphoniums. Our next instrument is a student level euphonium. This has more conical tubing than the baritone. This is a four valve model, but student level euphoniums come with three valves or four valves. I also notice that I have three silver plated instruments here. They can also be lacquer or gold plated. This particular student level euphonium, you'll notice has the tuning side in the front and has a larger bell, 
body size, tubing, and mouthpiece than its smaller baritone cousin. You'll also notice on the four valve models that the four valves are all in line at the top. This is an important difference when you move to a professional level euphonium. On most professional level euphoniums, the valve layout is set three on the top and one on the side. This is to help with something called the compensating system. Professional level euphoniums also generally have a larger bore size and a larger mouthpiece than the student level instruments. And also, just so you know, we're lucky enough to have the euphonium's larger cousin on our set, the tuba. In closing, as we get ready to talk about making a good sound, I want to tell you the history of the word euphonium. It comes from the Greek word euphos, which means sweet sounding. So I hope you make a sweet sound with your euphonium. Now we're to the very exciting moment when we get to open up the case and see our beautiful new instrument. A couple things I want you to be aware of is you need to be very careful. Music instruments are quite expensive and we don't want to damage them. First of all, when we have our case, we want to set it down on its side. We'll know it's in the right position when we can read the name of the company and it's right side up. Next, we'll open the locks and hold the case open. I always suggest to my students when they get the instrument out to use both hands to pick up the instrument. These instruments can cost anywhere from 500 to thousands of dollars. You can use two hands. You don't want to drop this beautiful shiny new instrument. Next, you pick up the mouthpiece with your right hand. You'll insert the small end of the mouthpiece into the lead pipe and give it a small turn to the right. Don't over tighten it or you may get the mouthpiece stuck. We're now ready to learn more about the euphonium. As we get ready to play our first notes, the next part that we need to be aware of is about our posture and hand placement. Posture is very important, especially for the low brass instruments because we're going to have to use a lot of wind and breathe very efficiently. As we get ready for our posture, we want to make sure that our three H's are in line. I call it the head, the heart, and the hips. Okay, we want to make sure those are in line and we're back as off the back of the chair, sitting up nice and straight, and that we also have our feet flat on the floor. As we get ready to pick up the instrument, one important thing is the height of the mouthpiece. If you notice, if we just set the euphonium on our leg, the mouthpiece is too low for me to reach with keeping the head, heart, and hips in line. If I bring my lips to the mouthpiece, we get a posture like this. This is not good posture. Instead, a great tool is to get a towel from home, roll it up, and use it as a little euphonium prop. Set it here on our left leg, set the euphonium on top, and the mouthpiece is now at the proper height for us to play. Now, to discuss hand position, one of the things we want to make sure is we're going to use our left hand to hold the instrument and our right hand to work the valves. With our left hand, and I love my euphonium, I always think about hugging the instrument. So I'm going to grab the far side of the instrument and hug it close to me over my left leg. With the right hand, I'm going to bring it up and place my fingertips on the top of the valves and take my thumb and put it underneath the handbar. Now we come to the most important aspect of your playing, breathing. We play wind instruments and having a lot of wind, a lot of air through the instrument is what makes a great sound. As we get ready to take a good breath, we need to remember a couple things. First of all, we want to make sure and start the breath down low. We also want to make sure that we're very relaxed. We don't need to be tense. So, 
Let me demonstrate once. As you can see, I also start the breath down low. A thing that I like to think about is like when you come home from school and pour yourself a glass of milk. The milk fills up the glass from the bottom to the top. This is the same way we want to think about our breathing, filling up from the bottom to the top. Watch once more and notice how the breath begins low. One thing to be aware of, some people will raise their shoulders and get really tense when they breathe. It might sound something like this. Or, watch a good breath again. Again, relaxed and starting down low. As a fun trivia thing for you to know, each time I take a breath in, and a breath out, my lung capacity is about five liters. That's about two and a half soda bottles. As we talk about hand position, specifically with the right hand on the valves, we're going to talk about a couple things. We want to make sure that the hand stays nice and relaxed. We also want to make sure that the fingers are nice and arched with the fingertips on the tops of the valves, sort of like holding a ball. Now, I have a very fun game that I teach my students to make sure that they have perfect finger position on the valves. What we do is we take a valve felt or coins and put it between our finger and the top of the valve. And we try and play passages and see if we can keep the felts and coins in the position. If we lift our finger off the valves, the felts will fall off. Excellent, we're almost to the exciting part of making the first sound on our instrument. First thing though, we need to make sure that our lips are set up correctly. In music, we have a fancy word to describe the lips called embouchure. Okay? So we get ready to make the embouchure, there's a couple things that we want to make sure. We want to make an M sound and a little bit of a puckered smile. Okay? The corners of our mouth will be nice and firm and we want to keep the inside of our lips nice and relaxed. When we go to place the mouthpiece, we want to put it evenly from top to bottom and from left to right. One of the great tools that I have to utilize this is called an embouchure visualizer. It's basically just the ring of the mouthpiece and you'll be able to see the inside of my lips. Again, one of the things that I want you to notice are good firm corners, good relaxed lips, on the inside and that the jaw is nice and open. We want to think about a little bit of an O shape to the lips and to the embouchure. Look again. Now, when we go to place our mouthpiece there, you can see that it models similarly. If you'd like, one of the nice things I like to do before we start buzzing on the mouthpiece is actually just blow a gentle breath through the mouthpiece. The next thing we're going to talk about is buzzing your lips. Now, we talked about embouchure earlier, and let's just review that for a second. We want to make sure that the mouthpiece is 50% top lip, 50% lower lip, and in the center, left to right. I've got my visualizer here to show you again. I encourage you to look in the mirror when you have your mouthpiece to make sure that the embouchure and the mouthpiece placement is correct. One more time with the visualizer.
Now, when we start to buzz the lips or vibrate the lips, there's a couple of very important things. We talked about having good posture and taking a good deep breath. Now, the other thing that's important to create a good vibration here is that the corners are nice and firm and the lips inside are nice and relaxed. Sometimes I like to think of it like a guitar string where it has fixed point on each end but loose and resonant in the middle. Now, when we get ready to buzz the lips, we're basically going to take a deep breath, blow from the diaphragm and chest, through the throat, through the mouth, into the mouthpiece. But I thought I'd demonstrate it first on the visualizer so you can actually see the vibration. <laughs> Now, when we utilize the mouthpiece, we again want to make sure that it's in a good position, top to bottom and left to right. Corners are firm, lips are relaxed, we take a deep breath and we blow air. <laughs> Now, I have a fun little equation that I teach my students. It's air equals buzz equals sound. And the more air that we use, the better the buzz will be equals the better the sound will be. Also, the opposite is true. If we don't blow a lot of air, we're not going to get a very good buzz and we're not going to get a very good sound. There's a couple fun games that I like to play that we can check how good the airflow is. The first one, you'll utilize your mouthpiece and a piece of paper. And what you'll do is you'll hold the piece of paper about six inches in front of the mouthpiece. When you buzz the note, if the airflow is good, you'll see the paper will move. If the airflow is not very good, then the paper will stay still. Here's a good vibration and good note. You can see that the paper moved quite a lot. Okay, if the paper doesn't move for you, you're not blowing the air enough. If you have difficulty getting the lips to vibrate effectively, there's two games that I like to play. The first game is a horse game. Basically, we're just going to make our lips as loose as possible and make a little bit of a horse sound like this. Very good, nice and relaxing. The corners are relaxed and the lips are relaxed. The second game that I like to play, I call it the motorcycle game. And we're going to keep our corners firm this time, but vibrate just the middle of the lips. You can even sort of be the accelerator with your right hand of the motorcycle. It sounds a little bit like this. Okay, a nice little fun exercise. You can also do some slurs where we go from low note to high note. Sounds something like this. trying to go as relaxed as possible. So now, let's practice our equation of air equals buzz equals sound on our instrument. We're going to take our mouthpiece, put it into the mouth pipe, and give it a small turn to the right. Remember to have good posture, take a deep breath, and blow a lot of air. <laughs> If you're buzzing correctly, you'll get a nice, full, vibrant tone quality. As we get ready to begin our first notes, it's important for us to know how to start each note correctly and cleanly. We like to use a word called articulation or attack to describe this. 
And how we're going to create this is by speaking a syllable while we're playing. The syllable I like to use is the word toe. What this does is it's very nice, open, and relaxed, just like what we talked about with our breathing and our embouchure. So how I like to teach my students is I have them say the word toe three times and then I have them practice saying it without the mouthpiece. So it sounds and looks something like this. Toe, toe, toe. You can also, if you happen to have that handy embouchure visualizer, utilize it in the same pattern of saying toe, toe, toe. Toe, toe, toe. You can watch yourself in front of a mirror and see whether the tonguing is clear and precise.